Ah, this is The Crisscross Show. I'm back and I have an action-packed episode for you today. So first, I'm going to be talking about the MLB. I'm going to talk about the standings and my predictions for how the season will pan out. I also am going to talk about the WNBA because the playoffs for the WNBA are near. So I'm going to be talking about the standings and my predictions for which team is going to make the playoffs. Also, I bring back something, nothing, or everything. I also bring back fly on the wall. And I'm going to talk about the NFL QB tiers list that came out today. So anyways, enjoy. So before every episode, I show you a jersey. Now I'm going to show you a basketball jersey and a baseball jersey. I'll show you the baseball jersey first. So this is a Cody Bellinger Dodgers jersey. I'm a huge Dodgers fan. I've liked the Dodgers for a long time. I'd say maybe 2016 when the Cubs beat the Dodgers. I think it was in the NLCS. I've been a Dodgers fan since. Now, what's funny is that now that I live in San Antonio, um, walking around, I see a lot of people wearing Astros hats or Astro, in general Astros fans. Now, the funny thing about this jersey is I wore this to the gym just to, you know, the Dodgers played and it's a really nice crispy jersey. And I wore this to the gym and I got so many eyeballs. So many people just gave me dirty faces. So many people were like confused as to why I was wearing this jersey. I thought it was really cool. I smiled all the way through it. You know, it's always nice to, to show cheaters like Astros fans what non-cheaters look like. And you know, being a Dodgers fan, that's what makes me a non-cheater. Also, I just wanted to continue showing off this jersey. Again, this was a gift. This is a gift by my students. I really like this jersey. Again, it's LeBron, my favorite player. It's an awesome jersey, and I just thought I'd share that with you. Anyways, back to the regular scheduled program. All right, so going on to the MLB. So the All-Star break was last week. Now we're kind of headed into the home stretch of the regular season for the MLB. Now, first, I'm going to give you the current standings, and obviously you'll be able to see them somewhere here on the screen but i'm going to give you the current standings and then i'm going to give you my predictions on the division winners on who i think is going to win the division who i think is going to make the playoffs now before i start i do want to make note that the mlb changed their playoff format so back you know back last year or big back um, a couple years ago only 10 teams would make the playoffs in total. So it'd be five from the AL, five from the NL. Now they added an extra team to make the playoffs. And their playoff format is the first two seeds will get a bye in a sense. And then the third through six seeds will battle in like a wild card, um, wild card game. And then obviously you'll battle the, the division winners from there. So the top two seeds will get the number one seed. Unfortunately, the third best division winner will have to be in the wild card uh, game or games, and you know they'll have to compete basically for their life as well. So you'll have four wild card games, and then you'll have the two division leaders just kind of chilling and waiting on that. So just wanted to get that out there first. So there is six teams making the playoffs: for the AL and the NL each. All right, moving on to the division leaders as of right now in the AL. The East, the Yankees, no surprise, they're 66 and 31. I do believe they have a 13 and a half game lead over the second best team in the division, which is the Blue Jays. In the AL Central, the Twins are holding on to a, I think, five and a half game lead over the Guardians. No, actually, three and a half game lead over the Guardians right now in the standings in the AL West. The Astros are 64 and 32, and they hold, I do believe, a 13 game lead over the Mariners. Basically, they're probably going to win the division. Switching gears to the National League. As of right now, the Mets currently lead the division by one and a half games above the Braves. The Braves are right on their tail. Moving on to the Central, the Brewers hold a two and a half game lead over the Cardinals for the division right now. In the NL West, the Dodgers are currently 64 and 30, have the second best record in the league, and have a... I think it's 10 game lead over the Padres for the division. Now, for my predictions, going to the AL, I do believe that the Yankees are going to win the division. I mean, they have a 13 game lead for the division, and I think they're going to get the number one seed in the AL playoffs. 
I do believe that the Blue Jays and the Rays are going to make the playoffs too. Remember, keep that in mind. In the Central, I do believe that the White Sox are going to come out of nowhere and win the division over the Twins. I think the White Sox have been, they're, they're currently 7-3 and three in their last 10 games. And I think, you know, they've had kind of a roller coaster year. And I think they're just going to hit a hot stretch for like two weeks and then, you know, end up catching up to the Twins and winning the division. I do have the Twins, though, making the playoffs. So there you go. Moving on to the AL West, I think the Astros are just going to run away with it. I think they're going to be done with the division by mid-September, and I think they're just going to blow past everyone. Now, as of right now, if the playoffs were to start today, the Mariners would make the playoffs. They'd be the sixth seed. I do not believe that the Mariners are going to make the playoffs, which is why I added the White Sox instead of the Mariners. The Mariners had a 14-game winning streak before the All-Star break, and since the All-Star break, they are 0-3. They've hit a reality check. I understand that they played the Astros in the three-game series, but I do believe they hit a reality check and they're going to not make the playoffs. They have like a, a streak of like not of something amount of years not making the playoffs. And I'm sorry, I have a friend named Dan who's a huge Mariners fan who lives in Seattle, but sorry, maybe next year, you know. All right, moving on to the NL what or into the National League starting with the East I I I have the Braves winning the, the division and getting the second seed in the playoffs. I do have the Mets winning or actually making the playoffs as a 4 seed. So I still have the Mets making the playoffs and I have the Braves winning the division and making the playoffs. In the Central, I have the Cardinals overtaking the Brewers for the division. I think the Brewers have had multiple chances, especially in such a bad division where you have the Pirates, the Cubs, and the Reds, all 40 games and under and wins. They have not taken advantage, and I, and I think that the Cardinals are going to take advantage as we get into more into the season because the Cardinals, I think they have a streak of, you know, having a, a, a positive record or a winning record um, for some, some amount of years. So I think that they're going to win the division and just catch up to the Brewers. And I think the Cardinals, as of right now, are the only teams that I have in Central Division in the NL Central making the playoffs. I don't think the Brewers are going to make the playoffs. Going to the NL West, I have the Dodgers winning the division and getting the number one seed in the playoffs, or at least in the NL. I have the Padres making the playoffs, and I have the Giants making the playoffs. So here is my prediction, as you'll see it somewhere here on the screen on my predictions on how the seeds will pan out and you'll also see the playoff bracket. Now starting with the wild card games, I have the Mets beating the Padres, I have the Giants beating the Cardinals, and in the AL I have the Blue Jays winning the Rays, beating the Rays, and then I have the Twins beating the White Sox. Sorry to all my White Sox fans. You know, Tony La Russa kinda sucks and your team's you know up and down. I think that's gonna play off in the wild card game. Now, if you look at the divisional round, I have the Dodgers beating the Mets 3-2. to two. I, for some reason, thought it was a seven-game series, but the divisional round is a five-game series. So I have the Dodgers winning in a classic against the Mets in a 3-2 to two series win. I have the Braves losing to the Giants in 3-2 to two in a huge five-game uh, five series. I think the Braves can win, but I also just have the Giants winning because the Giants right now are currently you know injured and you know they're having guys in and out of the lineup and i think they're going to get their guys healthy by the playoffs and they'll be good moving on to the al i have the yankees winning in four games over the blue jays and then i have the astros sweeping the twins if the white Sox made it i'd have the astros still sweeping i think the astros are just going to clean house there going on to the nlcs and the alcs i have the dodgers winning in five over the giants the way they played them this past weekend they swept them I think they're going to do the exact same thing just dominate them and score runs when they need to in the ALCS I have the Astros aka the cheaters winning against the Yankees they're going to find some way to cheat and they're going to beat the Yankees in six games and then for the World Series I have the Dodgers winning in five games I have the Dodgers getting their revenge from 2017 and beating the cheaters I mean the Astros in five games and there you go the Dodgers are going to win the World Series I would put a bet on it right now 
and let me know how much you win or how much you put when you put that bet in. So anyways, that is my MLB standings and predictions for the playoffs. All right, moving on to the WNBA up next. Okay, so moving on to the WNBA standings and predictions for the playoffs. So I've always been like a borderline Chicago Sky fan. Like I've always liked Chicago Sky. Uh, never really watched them too much. I knew Allie Quigley was pretty good because she was always winning the three-point contest. And Courtney Vandersloot's like, you know, their point god. And then Candace Parker, when she came over, that was awesome. I hated Candace Parker with the LA Sparks, but now I like her. So anyways, I've always been a Sky fan, and then I just kind of gravitated to, you know, watching other players. I just follow other players on Instagram and, you know, kind of keep up on them and keep track more on the WNBA now than I did before. Now, going on to the WNBA, it is a 12-team league, and the top eight teams make the playoffs. They recently changed their playoff format this year. Last year it was a 1-1-1-5-5, one, 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 five, five. so it was one game, one game, one game, and then a five-game series, five-game series, and that was kind of it. So they made it because a couple years ago it was so, I guess it was so, the way the teams were, you know, I guess, what's the word, the way they were constructed was that they were top-heavy on the west and in the east kind of was bad so the reason why they changed the playoff format from east to west was because the west was so good like you had the minnesota lynx the la sparks and i think for a little bit it was um i, I think was, and in phoenix as well all the teams in the west were top heavy and then you'd get like an eastern conference team that come out of nowhere and get obliterated so they changed the format just to kind of do more of like one team or like you know the two best teams will play each other in the finals and whatnot so um it, they did recently change it at least this year to a one through eight seed in general they have 12 teams in the uh in the league anyway so having a one through eight about two-thirds of the league makes it and i really like this format because i think it's a three five five playoff formats so with the three game series for the first round five games for the second round and then the finals are a five game series now I really like this because again it gives teams chances. It gives it gives them a chance to kind of play in the playoffs. Like their, their last format was a one game, one game, one game. So like if you lost that game, you're out. It wasn't until the conference semifinals when you basically you know had a chance to fight for your playoff lives. Now they finally gave the first round a three game series, which is, makes it a little bit more competitive and more fun. So the top eight teams make the playoffs. It's a three game series for the first round. Looking at the standings, you see Chicago and Las Vegas are currently in the playoffs. They made the playoffs. They clinched their playoff spot a couple of days ago. And then you'll see the Indiana Fever is eliminated. So if you look at the top five seeds in general, they're all pretty comfortably safe. Like the Mystics, you can feel like they're going to make the playoffs because they have, they have a five game gap over the LA Sparks, which is the sixth seed. So I feel like they win two more, win two to three more games, they're fine, they'll make the playoffs. So I, I feel like one through five is kind of solidified, just where they're gonna shift is kind of the hard part there. And then you have six, seven, eight, nine, ten, and if you wanna put 11 in there, the, the six through 11 seeds, they can be interchangeable. So you'll, you'll see, it's like a two game gap between the six and the 11 seeds. So these next couple games are really, really critical. Now, some teams have eight games left, some teams have nine games left, and then some have seven or six. So the games left are gonna be really, really critical, and it being a 12-team uh, league, these games are going to be really, really important because some of these teams are gonna be playing each other that are gonna try to, you know, that are right next to each other in the standings. I mean, six through 11 are within two games of each other, so going on a three-game win streak would be huge right now. Now, my predictions for who's going to make the playoffs, obviously you have Chicago and Las Vegas. I'm going to predict the Connecticut Sun, the Seattle Storm, and the Mystics are all going to make the playoffs. I think that's kind of safe to say. All they really have to do is just win two more games, and realistically, they're in the playoffs. Now, as you'll see, 6 through 11, they're all within two games. I do believe Phoenix is going to sneak into the playoffs, and I also, and whose place are they going to take? As of right now, I feel like they're going to take Dallas' spot. 
Dallas is kind of a good team. They play really, really good with each other. But I think Phoenix is going to take that Dallas spot and make the playoffs. Right now, Phoenix has been kind of dealing with their own issues. But I think Phoenix is going to kind of wrap up and, you know, make the playoffs. I think they're going to make an eighth seed and so forth. Also, I'm a huge Sophie Cunningham fan. So I hope Phoenix makes the playoffs. I do believe the Liberty are not going to make it. And the Minnesota Lynx, I think it's a little too late for them. Unless they go on a hot streak like winning three in a row. But I do have Phoenix sneaking in, taking Dallas a spot in the playoffs. I think Atlanta's a little bit of a better team. They haven't played good, but they, from what I've seen when they've played the Sky, they play really good. So I have Phoenix making the playoffs, uh, taking out the Dallas Wings. I have Atlanta moving to seven, and I have Phoenix making the eighth seed, playing Chicago, probably getting swept against Chicago. So those are my predictions on who's going to make the playoffs. Obviously, I'll make a different episode when the playoffs, when the WNBA playoffs actually start to show you my actual predictions and who I think is going to win the actual WNBA finals. Anyways, that was my segment on the WNBA. Hopefully you enjoyed it. Watch some games. I know they're on uh, in the summer at least. Like Some games are on at 11. Some games are on at 2. And then we have night games as well. But make make note the playoffs do start for the WNBA on August 17th so make sure you're watching these games because a lot of these games are going to be super competitive because these teams all want to make the playoffs so anyways on to the next thing which is something nothing or everything okay so this segment is called something nothing or everything now this is where I give you three different scenarios or three different things and I tell you whether they are something nothing or everything so starting first with Dennis Schroeder to LA question mark now last week the um, or actually last week Dennis Schroeder posted on Instagram and then LeBron commented saying tough and then Dennis Schroeder comments back saying let's reunite now what do I think is this something nothing or everything I think this is something I think Dennis Schroeder deserves to be in the league he's a pretty good player he's sneaky and he's really, really good defensively for a guy being like, I think six foot or six foot one. He was with the Lakers two years ago and I heard reports that not many like LeBron and AD weren't really too happy with him or too thrilled with him throughout the season, but he's a really, really good player. And when LeBron was out two years ago with injury, he kind of held the team pretty good, like just above water. Now, again, if you lose LeBron James, statistically speaking, your team doesn't do that good when he's gone. Right, so Dennis Schroeder can only do so much. He can only lead the charge. Obviously, they had Marc Gasol, who was also a pretty good leader. But I think that this is something because I think the Lakers should be considering bringing back Dennis Schroeder. If you keep Russell Westbrook, bring in Dennis Schroeder. Dennis Schroeder and Russell Westbrook played with each other for, I think, two years in OKC, and they did pretty well with each other. I think Dennis Schroeder can play. He still can play, and he's a pretty good defensive guard. Again, he will go on long stretches where he's cold, but I think his defense, and especially what Darvin Ham has been preaching, I think it's going to be good for LA. So I think that this is something that is something that the Lakers should look into if Russell Westbrook is to stay. All right, moving on. Donovan Mitchell worth seven picks. Now I saw this report that Danny Ainge, the GM for Utah, is asking for seven, eight picks. I thought. Um, I think that this is nothing. This is baloney. He got a huge haul for Rudy Gobert. I don't know how he did it. But he got a huge haul for Rudy Gobert, and that kind of ruined the NBA market. Obviously, Kevin Durant hasn't been traded because Brooklyn's like, Rudy Gobert, a decent player, got that much. We want, you know, a whole team for Kevin Durant. So I think Donovan Mitchell is not worth seven picks in general. I think maybe he's worth two players and maybe two picks. But I don't think, I think that this is nothing. This is just baloney. I think this is just kind of being greedy for what you got in your last trade. I think Donovan Mitchell probably will get traded to New York. Um, I'm seeing reports that Sacramento's interested in him and so forth. I think Donovan Mitchell will get traded maybe for two, three picks possibly, but this is nothing. This is, I think this is awful that Danny Ainge would even ask for seven picks for Donovan Mitchell. Donovan Mitchell is not a needle mover. He's not Steph Curry. He's not LeBron. He's not Giannis. He's not KD. Stop. Get three picks at most for him and call it a day. So that's nothing. 
All right, number three, Russell Westbrook splits with his agent. After, I think, 10 plus years with his agent, Russell Westbrook and his agent called uh, called their own ways and are going their own, are actually going their own separate ways. Now, this to me is everything because his agent reportedly wanted him to stay with the Lakers and kind of fall under Darvin Ham's uh, system or, or plans for him, which is basically become a better defender and play off the ball. Russell Westbrook uh, apparently had a, a reconcilable difference with him, and that's what caused the split. Is Russell Westbrook wants out of LA now? Do I want Russell Westbrook out of LA? Yes, I didn't like it when he first got traded back. Uh, it's all, we're coming up on almost a year. Russell Westbrook got traded to Lakers. I didn't like it then. I don't like it now. I tried to like it for a little bit, but then when I saw them play and I didn't see that spark, I just didn't like it. Now again, LeBron throughout the summer, the Lakers this summer have been kind of flirting with the whole idea of Kyrie Irving, Buddy Heald, Miles Turner. Now I wanted to tell you guys or talk about this. Have you ever seen that meme where the guy is turning around looking at that other girl while he's holding hands with that one girl? That is LeBron James with Kyrie Irving and Russell Westbrook. He's holding Russell Westbrook's hand because uh, obviously they're still on the same team, but he's flirting with Kyrie Irving and he did that a lot this summer was he's like I like Kyrie him and Kyrie were in LA together they were supposed to do the Drew League together that to me is the perfect reason as to why Russell Westbrook has to leave the Lakers because of what's been going on this toxicity that's been going on between the two obviously not talking to each other in the summer league and that being reported out I think that this needs to happen his agent was wrong for wanting him to stay I guess saying you know five teams in five years or four teams in four years is a bad look for a guy who's a former MVP and I think Russell Westbrook is right for wanting to leave and I think he should leave because to go back after hearing all the rumors and everything and all the LA fans kind of going against them I think that this is the best move for Russell Westbrook and him splitting up with his agent to me is everything because that just solidifies that he wants out and we should get out of Russell Westbrook. So anyways, that was my segment of something, nothing, or everything. Up next is Fly on the Wall. All right, so this is my segment where I call Fly on the Wall. Now this is a segment where I give you, or I show you a video of what someone said, and then I, like a fly on the wall, just an outside observer, tell you what I think on those particular comments. Now, this, specific segment on fly on the wall comes from the shop which is lebron james's hbo tv show now i have my own issues with the shop because when you think of barbershops and you think of going there you think of people arguing about sports obviously an all in good nature but they're arguing about sports right we're like they're like no lebron's the best or michael jordan's the best kobe's this kobe's that so you hear in barbershops uh you know arguing with each other on sports but in LeBron's shop or barbershop TV show, it's all of them just agreeing with each other. Like they'll say something about like, oh, that's really cool. It's more of like a therapy lesson. And that's not, I'm not a huge fan of that, that it's more of a therapy lesson as opposed to them arguing. Cause all you see is them agreeing with each other as opposed to them arguing like you'll see in a barbershop. Anyways, moving on to LeBron's comments. I'm gonna show you this video right here and I'll give you my thoughts on it after. Thing. Fair or not fair, do you love that pressure at this point in your career of like win or bust? I don't care about scoring title, I don't care about anything, it's win or bust. You think, do you like that pressure? Yeah, I'm obsessed with it, with win or bust. And what, all, what, what, what makes me have sleepless nights is when you don't have everyone that feels the same way in your, on your club. That's the culture you were talking about. Like, it's times where I wish I was like a tennis player or a golfer where it was literally like, look in the mirror, motherfucker, is you. So LeBron talks about how he is all about winning. Um, he's all about championship or bust, right? Now LeBron has every right to be all about championship or bust because literally the media all talks about LeBron James' teams being contenders. And every year they tarnish his legacy saying, oh, he lost again. He's not as good as Michael Jordan and whatnot. Now LeBron's comments to me are just him saying out loud what everyone else thinks. He's all about winning and when his teammates, and when he feels teammates aren't feeling the same or aren't on the same 
mindset as him, he has those sleepless nights. Now, it's just very similar to you and your job and you feel this way. And then when you feel someone else, like your coworker isn't on that same level, you get a little mad on them, right? Like you're kind of like, I'm all about this, but you don't feel the same way. You feel like you have some other goals. And it's just one of those things where like, the people that don't match your energy, you don't want to be next to them, right? That's just how everyone is. If, if you have disagreements with them and you have these constant head buddings with them, you don't want to be around them, right? If they don't match your energy, you don't want to be around them, right? No, I didn't think LeBron's comments were particularly targeted towards anyone. I do believe that he was just kind of saying it out loud just to kind of send the message to his future teammates or future people that come into his team that he's all about winning and he's all about winning now. So that was my fly on the wall. I just hear LeBron comments, making comments on that. And I just think that, well, that's kind of, you know, what we all think already about LeBron, right? Every year it's a championship or bust for him. And I think that he's saying exactly what everyone else thinks. And it's not, it's not particularly targeted towards someone, but I just think it's him just in general saying, this is what I'm about and yeah basically it so there you go that's my fly on the wall on lebron's comments on the shop up next i'm going to give you my thoughts on mike sandos qb tears that came out today okay so i'm going to show you mike sandos qb tier list so i think mike sando works for the athletic he's i know he's a writer that does these qb tier lists every year now you'll see his tier list right here. I got this from the herd, so I, I gotta let it. Uh, I got it from the herd. I, I was watching the herd this morning and I saw that and I'm like, oh, I gotta talk about that. So in his tier one, he has Rogers, Mahomes, Brady, Allen, Burrow, Herbert. Tier two, he has Stafford, Wilson, Watson, Jackson, Prescott, Carr, Murray, and Ryan. Tier three, he has Cousins, Garoppolo, Tannehill. Uh, Mac Jones, Baker Mayfield, Hertz, Wentz, Goff, Lawrence, and Winston. Tier four, he has Fields, Tua, Mills, Zach Wilson, Trey Lance, Daniel Jones, Marcus Mariota, Sam Darnold, Mitch Trubisky, and Drew Locke. Now, when I was watching the herd, I heard that he did he left Stafford and Russell Wilson out of tier one because that. Recently, they haven't been able to really carry a team. Obviously, you saw Matt Stafford for 11 years in Detroit make the playoffs, I think, twice maybe, but never been able to carry the Lions anywhere. And then Russell Wilson, obviously, the past couple years with the Seahawks has really been playing awful, or at least awful towards the end of the season. I don't have... I have my issues with some players, so like uh, Justin Herbert... I don't think he should be in tier one just because he missed the playoffs last year. I get it. This is for this year. But if we're really looking at it, I in a tough division with Patrick Mahomes, Derek Carr, and Russell Wilson, Justin Herbert is probably the third best quarterback in that division. So how can you put him ahead of all those other guys? Matt Stafford, again, I have an issue because he just won the Super Bowl and the two guys ahead of him, uh, Joe Burrow and Justin Herbert, he beat Burrow and Justin Herbert didn't make the playoffs. So, you know, that's my issue with Matt Stafford not being in Tier 1. Tier 3, Jimmy Garoppolo, obviously for multiple reasons. I'll get into it later. And then Tier 4, my issue here is Tua, just because I like Tua and I'll explain right now. So anyways, I'm going to give you my list. It's called Rodriguez's List. So... Tier one is gonna be in no particular order as you'll see here in the picture. So I'll go over my list. So I have Aaron Rodgers, Patrick Mahomes, Tom Brady, Josh Allen, Joe Burrow, and Matt Stafford. Matt Stafford again, won the Super Bowl. He's a pretty good quarterback. He played phenomenal when he had pieces around him. Tier two, I have, and this is in order. I have Russell Wilson, Lamar Jackson, Justin Herbert, Dak Prescott, Derek Carr, Kyler Murray, Jimmy Garoppolo, and Deshaun Watson. Now you may say, Jimmy Garoppolo, are you crazy? Jimmy Garoppolo is my favorite quarterback, and that's me being unbiased here 
He went to the NFC Championship game this past year, and he almost made the Super Bowl. He, was, he had a 10-point lead entering the fourth quarter. And also, he made the Super Bowl two years ago when he was healthy. So Jimmy Garoppolo, in my opinion, is a good quarterback. And for me, in my opinion, Tier 2 is a list where they can win you playoff games. These are quarterbacks that can win you playoff games, guaranteed, if they have the right if they have the right seed, in a sense. Obviously, Tier 1, I think, are quarterbacks that are always in the conversation for Super Bowl contenders. Going on to Tier 3, these are, these are kind of like bridge quarterbacks. These are like quarterbacks that are like, yeah, they'll get you into the playoffs, but you know they're not going to win. So I have Ryan Tannehill, Kirk Cousins, Baker Mayfield, Jalen Hurts, Mac Jones, Matt Ryan, Trevor Lawrence, Carson Wentz, Tua, Goff, and Winston. Now I think these are quarterbacks that can win you games, that can get you into the playoffs, but I think they're like first round exits. And I think that they're in this order, that's how they rank, and I think that that's how they should be ranked. Looking at tier four, which is just quarterbacks that you know you're just hoping that they spark or they're just newbies or they're just quarterbacks that you know they're just forever backups right i have justin fields trey lance zach wilson daniel jones mills mariota darnold trubitsky and drew lock i agree for the most part with mike sandals list there are a couple quarterbacks as i explained as to which ones i would move so obviously stafford to number tier one i'd move justin herbert down to number two i'd move jimmy garoppolo from three to two um i'd bring Tua up from four to three and so forth so those are my tier lists let me know what you think let me know if you think that mike sandals list is accurate or in the comments tell me which quarterbacks you think would should be moved to these different tiers i really like my list just because I feel like it's accurate, um, as I always do. And I think Mike Sando, he's a pretty good reporter from what I've heard. I haven't read too much about his work, but his list is pretty good. I just had my issues with about four or five quarterbacks. So there you go. That's my critique on Mike Sando's QB list. Anyways, that does conclude my episode. I hope to be back next time and giving you my NFL predictions for each team and how they will finish and who will be my play who will be in my playoffs for the nfl i want to give you those predictions so that way you can make your bets and you know fill out your fantasy teams however you feel necessary anyways i'm glad to be back it's awesome and i'll see you guys on the next one